Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about my trip, and then I'm going to talk about the places that I went. So that's my plan, to share about my trip to Israel this year. The first place that we went was actually an accident. We went to, um, we, we got to Israel, and as soon as we landed, we learned that some of our travel companions' flights were delayed by 12 hours or more. <laughs> so... Um, we had planned to set off on Monday morning, bright and early, and be on our way. And instead, we had to hang around t the Tel Aviv area so that we could be close to the airport. So we went, instead of going to Caesarea, which was our first destination, we went to Joppa, which is actually included in the city of Tel Aviv. They built Tel Aviv around Joppa, and these days they call it Jaffa. J-A-F-F-A, but in the Bible you'll find it as Joppa. So some pictures are going through up here, um, and you can look at those as I talk. This is St. Peter's Church Chapel that is in Joppa, and um, it was a beautiful space and this lovely um, art piece over the altar to commemorate the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter, and that's what we're talking about today is Peter's awakening to God's greater plan, God's greater kingdom plan. So Joppa is a seaport. I don't know if you can see that. Joppa is a seaport. And, um, and right now, it's, it's kind of a touristy destination. And it probably would have been <coughs> in Bible times as well, a touristy destination. It's a beautiful place. It's just absolutely beautiful. This is where I learned that Mediterranean blue really is a color. <laughs> uh, not, just a, not just a name of a color, but it is its own color. So Joppa has, forms this natural seaport, and so it was used, it's been used as far back as people have been in this area for trading, for shipping, um, and it wasn't until um, much later that other seaports were built in this area. So when we look at the Bible to see what the Bible says about Joppa, we find it in just a few places. And I found it very interesting pattern as I was looking at the city of Joppa. So it's mentioned first as being in the territory of the tribe of Dan. So it's mentioned just as briefly as existing. And it's mentioned as a major seaport. And in the New Testament, they talk about it being about 30 miles from Caesarea. It's a port of entry for the cedars that Solomon used to build the temple. And again, for the cedars used to rebuild the temple when the exiles returned from Persia, supported by King Cyrus. It's the port city where Jonah went to flee from God's call. It's the hometown of Tabitha, a faithful disciple of Jesus, who Peter healed by raising her from the dead. And it's the place where Peter was praying at Simon the Tanner's house when he was directed to take the gospel message to Cornelius, who was a Gentile. Joppa is the place where, again and again and again, it seems that the people of God encounter the world, not just, not in a bad way, but come in contact with the world and their faith at the same time. It's a place where God shows again and again that God's mission is greater than one people group in one isolated area of the world. When I was reading through these sections of scripture in Second Chronicles and in Ezra about how the people of Israel had contacted people outside of their nation and said, we know you have the best cedars. We need those for the house of God. We know you've got the best craftspeople who can do these things. We need them to come and to help build the temple. Both Solomon and, again, the returning exiles in the book of Ezra call out for Gentiles, for people from the nations, to come and help build the house of God. 
I found this really interesting in contrast to Jonah, who goes to Joppa because the last thing he wants is for people outside of his nation to come and participate in his faith. He goes to Joppa because God has sent him with a message, a prophetic message, to turn and repent to a people outside of his people group that were despised and hated because they were really bad guys. I mean, they were really bad guys. In Veggie Tales, they have them slapping people with fishes, but it was much worse than that. They were really bad guys. And Jonah said, I'm not going. I'm not going. And he went to Joppa to get on a ship to go to Tarshish, the opposite side of the world from where God had called him to go. It's this place where we find God popping up in unusual ways, doing unusual things that are invitational to those people who are not part of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Israel, to come and be part of this faith. This morning we're going to look at Acts chapter 10 and read this story about Peter and Peter's awakening to God's greater plan to invite every nation, tongue, tribe, and people group to come to know the gospel message, to come to faith. So if you want to follow along in Acts chapter 10, I am going to read the whole story. It's a long story. I'm going to read it, the whole thing. Hang on, you can do it. Acts chapter 10. In Caesarea, which we've already mentioned is about 30 miles from Joppa, in Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who was called Peter. He is lodging with another Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, they were on their journey and approached the city. Peter was on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. And he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up into heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of this vision he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius the centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, 
worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled, and he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying in the home of Simon the Tanner by the sea. Therefore, I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preached, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to all the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Peter was in Joppa because he had raised Tabitha from the dead. So if you go back a chapter and you read, she was a woman who had made clothing for widows out of her own money and her own resources. She had cared for the people who were around her, and she was a follower of Jesus. She died, and Peter was close by. They called him to come, and he raised her from the dead. And then he just stayed. <laughs> he just stayed. And having been in Joppa, I can tell you that when it was time for me to leave, after just a morning of being there, I didn't want to leave yet. <laughs> I didn't want to leave yet. It's a beautiful place. It's a peaceful place. Peter stayed with Simon the Tanner, and he was hungry. He was up on the roof praying while his food was being prepared, and the Lord took that opportunity to speak to him. God gave him a sign, a vision, he sent a sheet that lowered down from the sky with all kinds of food on it. Food that Peter had never eaten. Food that Peter had never tasted because it was unclean. Peter's hungry and he's looking at all of this forbidden food and a voice says, pick it up, Peter. Pick out your dinner kill it, prepare it, and eat it. And Peter said, I would never. God, you know I have never had unclean food. And the voice instructs him again. Pick out your dinner, Peter. K 
kill it, prepare it, eat it. And Peter says, no, I would never. And a third time, Peter, take and eat. And Peter says, no way. And the sheet is taken back up into heaven. And if the story stopped there, we would never know <laughs> what, what God was trying to say. Peter didn't know what God was trying to say. Peter sat there pondering this vision that he had had. Was it a test? Was this a test from God to determine if he was pure of heart, if he had followed the law? Was this, was this God saying, Peter, are you faithful to me? What was happening? Peter didn't know. But at that moment, and I think it's so interesting, the writer of Acts says, at that precise moment, suddenly, right then, just that moment, they were knocking at the door. God has good timing, I think. Just at that moment, they were knocking at the door. And they said, we're looking for Simon. No, not that Simon. Simon, who's called Peter. We're looking for Simon, who's called Peter, staying at Simon's house. Not Simon the Peter's house, Simon the Tanner's house. So that's a lot of instructions. It's <laughs> a lot of Simons. And Peter hears them, and he goes down, and he goes with them to do something that was forbidden. I can't imagine what it must have felt like for Peter. Because his entire life, he's been told, Jews do not associate with the people from the nations. They do not do it. You don't go in their houses. You don't eat their food. You're not their best friends. You'd stay away from those people. You stay away from those people. They are unclean. They are dangerous. They will take you down the wrong path. They will lead you astray from God. Stay away from those people, Peter. It was reinforced by his parents, by his family, by the teachers at the temple. Stay away. It's a big enough deal that when Peter goes to their house, it's the first thing he says. <laughs> it's the first words out of his mouth. So you guys know I'm not supposed to be here, right? I'm really not supposed to be here, and you know this, so why did you send for me? But Peter says this interesting thing. He says, you yourselves know that it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. A lot of times when you talk to Christians about this passage, they'll say, oh, well, that's when we knew that it was okay for us to eat unclean animals, so go bacon. But that's not what this story is about. Peter never does take from the sheet, kill and eat, make his own dinner. <laughs> He doesn't do it. The story is not about eating pork. The story is not about even eating bacon-wrapped shrimp soaked in butter. The story is summed up in this line. God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Peter went to their house Peter told them the message of the gospel, and Peter saw that God brought them into God's family of faith right there in that moment. Peter saw that God was at work, whether Peter thought it was okay for God to be at work there or not. Peter saw that God was at work bringing in those who were considered unclean and untouchable to be part of God's family of faith.
this led me to some questions. In what ways are we still putting up boundaries between ourselves and others? We may not be the Jewish people. We may not be God's chosen people, Israel, called to be set apart. But in what ways are we making ourselves and us and making people out there a them? In what ways are we saying to ourselves or to our children, stay away from those people. Those people are unclean. In what ways are we shutting down the Holy Spirit and saying, no, I'm not going to that place. No, I'm not talking to those people. I would never, Lord, you know, I would never set foot in that place. You know I would never associate with those people. Who are we keeping at arm's length? Convinced that they are unclean afraid of being contaminated, maybe even classifying them as unworthy of participating in God's kingdom. Who are we putting out there with an untouchable label? God's plan has always included every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people group. And guess what? entirely made up of sinners. Not a person that God spoke to in the Bible was righteous. Not one. Go look. You go find a righteous person in the Bible, I will pay you a hundred bucks. Okay, that's my challenge. All right, Charlotte's picking up her Bible. She wants to go to family camp for free. You find me a righteous person, not somebody who bears the title of righteous, but someone whose life is sinless. We think about righteous people, we go to who? We go to Noah. Well, God saved him from the flood, right? Him and his family, because he was righteous. What did Noah do? The minute, hang on just a minute, the minute Noah got off that boat, what did he do? Planted a vineyard. Who taught, who taught him how to make wine and why it was his first go-to to get so drunk that he dishonored himself in front of his children. They shamed them, that he cursed them. Noah may have been the most righteous man on planet earth, but he was not sinless. He was not sinless. We think about the judges, we think about the heroes of the faith of Samson and all of those people. Gideon tried to set himself up as a king, made an idol, put it on his family property. Samson betrayed everything that God ever asked him to do. We think of these righteous people, even though they were righteous by human standards, None of them were perfect. All of them were sinners. God's plan has always included every nation and tribe and tongue and people group and every one of them sinners. And Peter's great moment of clarity comes when he says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Paul goes on to say later an even better statement. Paul says, Here's a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Every one of us has something in our life that is not perfect, that is not surrendered, that still is inviting destruction. And every one of us has been invited into the kingdom of God so that those things can be healed, so that our wounds can be covered, so that Christ can offer us his righteousness. Sinners are so much a part of God's plan that it says that God sent Christ into the world to become sin for us. 
so that we could carry his righteousness. It's not dependent on us to decide who's in and who's out, to decide who's the bigger sinner and who gets a pass. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so God says to Peter, I've called these people to be part of my kingdom. Don't push them to the margin. Don't set them aside. 